Hey everyone, uh, as, as you all join us from around the world, it's a delight to have you all uh, here. My name is William Dillon, Dr. William Dillon in San Francisco, and uh, I'm a co-founder uh, for Health for the World, and uh, we're just absolutely delighted to have uh, Dr. Jenny Ben Cardino, uh, who is the Chief of Musculoskeletal Radiology at, at the University of Pennsylvania, presenting this morning on MR neurography of the lumbosacral plexus. And uh, this is a particularly interesting to me because we have been doing a lot of neurography at UCSF. Um, and as it has developed, I get as a neuroradiologist further and further away from the brain and, and more towards the, the fingertips. So I'm really looking forward to this uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Ben Cardino started her academic career as uh, an assistant professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School and was promoted to full professor of radiology and orthopedic surgery at NYU School of Medicine in 2014. She's currently chief of musculoskeletal imaging and professor of radiology at Penn Medicine. Uh, she does have a hard stop today, uh, about quarter two, so I'm going to turn it over to her now. Uh, and thank you very, very much for your time and presentation today, Dr. Ben Cardino. Thank you so much, Dr. Dillon. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, you certainly have made a wonderful project out of uh, Health for the World, and I'm honored to uh, now be part of it. So let's start with a MR neurography of the lumbosacral plexus. I have no disclosures to make. Nerve impingement syndromes are rather challenging. Um, it's a challenging diagnosis, both for radiologists and clinicians alike. Uh, we need to know the very complex neural anatomy and innervation patterns in order to arrive to a correct interpretation of nerve imaging studies. Nerve impingement syndromes can occur anywhere in the body, but they tend to happen more commonly in areas where there are fibro-osseous channels near joints. So we see compressive neuropathies more commonly in these locations. And if there is a fibrous band or an accessory muscle that may cause um, uh, it, it, it occupy a space, then um, there is going to be more propensity uh, to have a compressive neuropathy. Of course, the space occupying lesions near joints, we often find ganglia, hematomas, osteophytes, lipomas, stenosynovitis may also uh, cause mass effect and uh, lead to compressive neuropathies. There are other types of entrapments that have to do with dynamic compression, and those are related to joint motion. So typically carpal tunnel syndrome, repetitive flexion and extension at the level of the carpus is going to lead to entrapment of the median nerve. Same thing with the ulnar nerve in the cubital canal in the elbow. So these are dynamic entrapment neuropathies. The reference standard uh, for diagnosis of entrapment neuropathies is clinical diagnosis, although it can be challenging, particularly if the nerve that is entrapped is deeply situated in the human body, and electrodiagnostic studies. Um, I am a person who underwent EMG study once in my life. I do not recommend it. It's painful, uh, so it does cause patient discomfort, and it may lead to inconclusive results in up to one third of cases. Uh, so it is not uh, really a gold standard. And on MRI, nerve entrapments are manifested depending on what sequence we are um, assessing. So if we are looking at T1 and non-fat sat proton density sequences, nerves are going to behave very similar to muscle. So muscle is going to be your standard to compare to. We have here uh, the division of the sciatic nerve into the common peroneal nerve and the tibial nerve in the distal thigh. And you can notice how there is this intermediate signal intensity quality uh, to the muscle to the nerve fascicles very similar to muscle. Uh, the human body was built in a very wise way, so nerves tend to be surrounded by fat. Uh, fat that protects the neurovascular structures from being damaged. That fat on T1 weighted images is bright, so it provides a beautiful back backdrop of 
bright and intermediate signal so that we can better outline uh, nerves on anatomic sequences. Now, on fluid sensitive sequences, nerves tend to have a little bit of increased signal intensity, and we need to learn how to interpret uh, this increased signal intensity. So, for intraven neuropathies, we want to see focal areas of increased T2 signal within the nerve fascicles at the site of entrapment. So we want to see that high signal intensity where the ganglia is located pressing on the nerve. We want to see the high signal intensity within the cubital tunnel or within the carpal tunnel. Uh, we don't want to see just a slightly increased signal intensity all throughout the course of the nerve. That is going to be just the normal appearance of the nerve on fluid sensitive sequences. Entrapped nerves tend to show changes in signal intensity, size, and position. So that's to keep in mind, what are we looking for? We're looking for changes in the signal intensity, the caliber of the nerve, and the course of the nerve. Those are direct signs of entrapment neuropathies. We have also indirect signs of entrapment neuropathies, which we call muscle denervation changes. So denervation changes are gonna help us because nerves are that have motor components are going to lead to a muscle um, um, group, and that muscle group is going to get um, uh, changes on T1 and T2 weighted sequences. So typically, edema-like T2 hyperintensity is seen in the earliest stage of nerve entrapments, and then progressively we're going to have fatty infiltration that may lead to a complete replacement of the muscle by fat. So acute only um, edema-like changes, bright signal on fluid sensitive sequences, subacute a combination of edema plus fatty infiltration, and chronic, uh, we're going to just see the fatty infiltration and the loss of muscle bulk. Technical considerations, we want to do a MAR neurography, and in this case, I'm going to talk about the lumbosacral plexus on a three Tesla magnet. So if you have a three Tesla unit, we prefer to uh, uh, book the patient to have the study in that, in that magnet. Uh, why? Because we want to play with increased SNR. We want to have higher spatial resolution, thinner slice sections, increased fluid conspicuity. We want to play with parallel imaging to do faster acquisition and prevent that motion um, may uh, limit uh, evaluation of, of nerves and particularly a small, a small nerve. So we want to do it fast. And we also want to suppress the adjacent vessels. And we can do all that on a three Tesla platform much better than on a 1.5. However, there is exception to these scheduling rules. So our schedulers, when they pick up the phone and, oh, it's a MR neurography of the lumbosacral plexus, they have to ask if the patient has hardware in the field that is going to be imaged. If there is hardware, that patient must go to a 1.5 Tesla magnet because the susceptibility artifact from metal in the field is gonna cause so much distortion that we won't be able to see the nerve. So that's the exception to the scheduling rule. Another important factor is the time of the day when you do the study. So I like to book my patients early in the morning have them go to the bathroom for sure before they go to the magnet so they can avoid the bladder. Uh, bladders, a full bladder can cause ghosting artifact, as you see here, and also have them MPO. Uh, the reason for that is that that decreases um, bowel movements, and bowel movements can also cause distortion uh, on a magnurography of the lumbosacral plexus. Find your B value, that's really important. When I started the program of MR neurography at NYU in 2013, I was inspired by Dr. Avdi Shabra, who has become you know, the king of uh, MR neurography. And he very um, selfishly uh, lent me all his protocols. Uh, so I started playing with the protocols and I invited him to spend a week with us uh, to check our program. And when he came to say, oh, your sequences are prettier than mine now. So that's good when we collaborate with other people, when we are not selfish, when we are, you know, um, want to advance 
patient care everywhere, not only in our institutions, is a beautiful thing. So we play with the B-value and the B-value that works best at 3 Tesla for uh, the PSIF sequences, uh, we uh, decided that is 80 milliseconds. I will go into the sequences just in a second. Coverage. So we want to cover the roots of the lumbosacral plexus. Uh, we include uh, from the mid level of L3 all the way down to the lesser trochanters. So that's the cranial coda dimension. On the mediolateral dimension, you want to include the muscles. So you see how I'm making sure that I'm including all the gluteal muscles in the field of view. And then here on the coronal sequences, you see the extent of the um, uh, cranial coat, um, uh, coverage edge from L3 to the femoral um, uh, proximal femur, the lesser trochanters. So this is what we're seeing, uh, the root of L3 coming out here under the L3 pedicle, the root of L4 um, being highlighted by fat in the paraspinal uh, um, region. Now, we also at the beginning had to play with what are we doing for fat suppression? And we play with selective fat starting and we didn't do that well. Um, we actually don't do selective fat sat in the pelvis anymore. We do a combination of a stir and a selective fat, a fat suppression. So uh, the Siemens plat platform that I use to do MR neurography has a stir, which is a combination, and it provides a very homogeneous, you can see the difference between selective fat satting with large field of view um, in, the, in the pelvis against a spare sequence where, you know, everything is more homogeneously um, um, decreasing signal intensity where, where there is fat. There are five sequences that we include uh, for three, uh, TMR neurography, one high resolution axial T1, and we have an example here of how uh, the images look like. Uh, we are taking advantage of the fat, uh, highlighting uh, nerve fascicles. So you can see here the obturator nerve uh, divisions, anterior and posterior, just proximal to the obturator foramen. Axial T2 uh, is spare, and this is a 2D sequence. So 2D axial T2 is spare. Um, we have very nice you know, fat suppression across the field. Coronal proton density, and I like to do it with a high resolution technique as well. And again, we are taking advantage of the uh, fat. Uh, we can see very nicely uh, the obturator nerve coming down here uh, in the pelvis. So uh, check that obturator nerve. You're going to see it in, in every patient if you look for it. Uh, and then we do two 3D sequences, one a space stair sequence and two a coronal 3D DW PSIF for reverse fast imaging with a steady state uh, free precession. This is an example of a, the 3D space spare T2 sequence. Uh, this is done at 0 0.8 millimeter cubic, uh, so really, really thin slices. Uh, and this is my very first patient at NYU in 2013. This patient had a foot drop following, um, unfortunately, a drug overdose. Um, the patient was lying on the floor of his apartment uh, for more than a day. Apparently, he was lying on his right buttock. And when he woke up, he had a foot drop. And we can see when we compare side to side the right sciatic nerve against the left sciatic nerve, the right sciatic nerve is increasing caliber, it's almost twice as big as the left-sided sciatic nerve, and it's also increasing signal intensity. So on, a sp on a sp a sp a sp images, we're looking for this intraneural increased signal intensity, which have vessels nearby we can compare whether the signal intensity is less or, or equal to vessel. Definitely, if a nerve has equal signal intensity to an adjacent vessel, it's completely abnormal, it's um, increasing signal intensity. And this is the PSIF sequence, also 0.8 millimeter cubic. Um, you can see the piriformis muscle uh, coming through the greater sciatic notch. And then on this patient on the right side, 
comparing uh, the right sciatic nerve against the left sciatic nerve, we come to a point where the fascicles, you can see here the fascicles, there is a pinpoint area of increased signal intensity within the nerve fascicles. There are no vessels here. We are suppressing the vessels and it's right under the piriformis, the inferior edge, uh, and also at the border of the superior gemellus. So in this space between the piriformis and the superior gemella, uh, gemellus muscle is where we see entrapment due to um, mechanical impingement by uh, the piriformis. In this case, the piriformis wasn't increasing in, in volume. It was just that he was lying on that side pressing on the on the on the nerve for a prolonged uh, period of time and these are the reconstructions of the 3d uh, space sequence uh, we can see on the right side this is the right sciatic nerve left sciatic nerve and we can see the difference in caliber of that um, right sciatic nerve and here just to emphasize why do we do two 3d sequences we do a 3d sphere sequence because we want to have the nerves, uh, the nerve signal adjacent to the vessels, and uh, so we can use uh, the vessels as a, a comparison. And then the PSIF takes away all the busyness of the nerves and lets us let us concentrate on the nerve fascicles themselves, so our eyes can pick up increased signal intensity within the fascicles themselves, as we can see here. Something cool that we can do and. Uh, you know, surgeons get very impressed with these uh, uh, movies is we can do uh, movie reconstructions of, of these uh, volumetric, um, uh, volumetrically acquired uh, images. All right, so let's move on to the anatomy of the lumbosacral plexus. The lumbosacral plexus has um, main branches. Um, the sciatic nerve is one of them. The sciatic nerve has a tibial uh, division and a peroneal division. The tibial division is medially located. The peroneal division is laterally located, and we'll go deep into the uh, sciatic nerve in just a second. The femoral nerve, um, I like to uh, find the iliacus muscle, and then the femoral nerve is going to be over the iliacus muscle in these uh, 3D uh, mid reconstructions when you are playing with the, with the images check for your iliacus muscle and then you'll find the femoral nerve next to it. The obturator nerve is the one that has the straighter course, so just check the paraspinal region and the nerve that you see coming down very squarely and straight, and that's the obturator nerve. It tends to go along the margin of the psoas too, so the psoas muscle is a good um, parameter. Um, anatomic parameter to find the obturator nerve. Let's move on to the uh, greater sciatic notch. So now we're going to go get into the sciatic nerve. In the greater sciatic notch, notch we have the piriformis muscle. Uh, the piriformis muscle exits through the greater sciatic notch from the pelvis into uh, the gluteal region, the posterior hip and it divides the greater sciatic notch into suprapiriformis and infrapiriformis notch. The suprapiriformis notch is the house of the superior gluteal neurovascular bundle. So you can see the superior gluteal neurovascular bundle there. And the infrapiriformis notch is where we are going to find the sciatic nerve. Uh, so we, we have the sciatic nerve uh, seen here, outlined by uh, fat, as it goes under the piriformis and about um, and uh, by the uh, gemelli muscles. In the sagittal plane, we have a similar distribution here. You can see uh, the localized image, piriformis muscle, and then sciatic nerve just beneath it. So the sciatic nerve is the largest nerve in the body. Uh, is termed the lifeline of the lower extremity. So this uh, patient who unfortunately uh, had a drug overdose and woke up uh, with a foot drop, um, you cannot move your lower extremity if your sciatic nerve goes. So uh, surgeons want to preserve it. We want to preserve the, to preserve the sciatic nerve, so it's a very important anatomic structure. It receives contributions from L4 to S3. 
is composed of two distinct uh, divisions, and these uh, drawings uh, were um, made uh, by a uh, visiting fellow uh, from Spain. She is now actually in England, um, and she's of, of Colombian background. So she combined a, 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 what, what this, this is really um, meant to be about, right? Uh, a, an international global community um, sharing uh, knowledge and, and uh, helping each other to, to advance medicine. So the tibial uh, division here is um, painted in green and the peroneal division is painted, painted in, in purple and um, is lateral, laterally located. In terms of functionality, the sciatic nerve is responsible for knee flexion because it innervates the posterior thigh muscle. So the hamstring musculature is innervated by the sciatic nerve. The tibial division is gonna do most of the hamstring muscles. The peroneal division only innervates the short head of the biceps femoris in the back of the thigh. Below the knee, it provides all sensory and motor functions except for the innervation of the medial leg, ankle, and foot, which is provided by the saphenous nerve, um, the terminal branch of the femoral nerve. Clinically, uh, when uh, the, uh, there is a, a sciatic neuropathy, we frequently see a spreading of the hamstring musculature, and we're gonna see that the uh, process affects uh, the muscles below the knee level. It more commonly affects the peroneal division with relative spreading of the tibial division. And this is due to the fact that the peroneal, the common peroneal nerve is fixed at two points. So when it goes by the ischial tuberosity, it's kind of tented there. We're gonna see some examples. And then it goes obliquely towards the side of the knee by the fibular head. So that, that the fibular head and the ischial tuberosity fix the um, uh, common peroneal nerve in two points and make it more susceptible of a stretch injury. And it's also more superficial. So um, that does, that's the reason why the, the, fuel, the common peroneal nerve gets more affected. The course of the sciatic nerve in the pelvis, we already saw it, uh, goes anterior to uh, about and th or through the piriformis muscle. Um, here is the reconstruction, that's the piriformis muscle here. Then it's gonna exit the greater um, sciatic notch or sciatic foramen under the piriformis and it's gonna go by the superior and the inferior gemellus, uh, the gemelli muscles. Then uh, we have the quadratus femoris, number three here, and the obturator internus, uh, which is um, probably part of this uh, muscle uh, mass in this location. Then it's uh, gonna continue down to the thigh and it's going to divide into the tibial and the uh, common peroneal nerve in the, in the distal thigh. In the pelvis, uh, what we do on the coronal images is that we want to find uh, the sciatic nerve as it gets formed in front of the sacrum. Then we identify the piriformis muscle right there. Uh, we have the sciatic nerve going under the piriformis muscle. Then we get to the greater sciatic foramen and we have the superior gemellus and the inferior gemellus muscle. Then we have the obturator internus, which helps me a lot in the axial plane. We'll see that in a sec and the quadratus femoris uh, right there. The ischial tuberosity is a very important structure also to keep in mind, so we see it here. And you can see the, the origin of the hamstring tendons is nearby uh, the uh, sciatic nerve. So all those structures are very important when we are assessing the uh, sciatic nerve at the level of the pelvis. And this is what I meant, I like to, in the axial plane, I find the obturator um, internus muscle, and then right at the posterior border of the obturator internus muscle, you are gonna find this little uh, fascicular, fascic this fascicular structure, this is the sciatic nerve. So it's normal to have fat between the fascicles of the sciatic nerve. <clears throat> the size of the sciatic nerve can be up to two centimeters in width. Um, the key element, about the fat between the fascicles is that it should not disturb, dis, um, 
distort the fascicles. So it shouldn't have mass effect. It should be just, you know, lying nice and quiet in between the fascicles without causing any displacement. And um, the fascicles are going to have intermediate signal intensity, as we already say, uh, similar to muscle. Um, here in the coronal plane, origin of the hamstring, sciatic nerve, tibial division, tibial division medially, lateral, um, laterally we have the um, common peroneal nerve division. And this is in the axial plane, uh, the piriformis is going to be located posteriorly and the sciatic is going to be lying on top of it. <clears throat> Now let's go into pathology, the uh, sciatic neuropathy. Uh, the key elements that we are looking for, I already mentioned, uh, increased signal intensity within the nerve, thickening of the nerve, and coarse deviation. So this patient has sciatic neuro neuritis, is just increased caliber and signal intensity to signal intensity in the nerve in this stretch located between the greater sciatic notch and just um, by the um, proximal uh, portion of the hamstring tendons. So this was uh, just sciatic neuritis. Uh, sciatic neurit neuropathy can also be seen in the setting of neurofibromatosis, but that's, that's, this is really you know, outside of the scope of this stuff, but just wanted to show you how um, the uh, nerves are going to be distorted by the neurofibromas in this condition. This is a case of sacral osteomyelitis, and um, this patient developed abscesses um, that were extending through the greater sciatic notches. Um, there is an anatomic bursa um, about the piriformis muscle, the piriformis mus uh, bursa, which make it distended. At um, I speculated that that was the case in this patient where we have these very large uh, fluid collections that are very well encapsulated and defined in the region of the greater sciatic notch. Uh, so the patient was having symptoms of sciatica more on the right side uh, because the abscess was much larger um, on on that side of the of the of the pelvis. This is. Uh, Relatively often seen, unfortunately, in patients who have hamstring tendon repair, um, this patient had undergone a repair with a surgical anchor. Uh, we can see the anchor suture right here uh, within the ischial tuberosity. And the uh, patient um, developed these adhesions between the um, surgical device and the sciatic nerve. So the sciatic nerve was being, you can see the change here in the sciatic nerve, it was being tented by these adhe adhesions um, between uh, the, uh, the surgical anchor and the, and the nerve, and the nerve um, is markedly increasing caliber, um, and this patient had a foot drop. So she had to go to surgery, um, surgical scar tissue was found in between the nerve and the ischial tuberosity, they did uh, an uh, adhes ad adhesion lysis. They um, got rid of the adhesions that they found there. And she, uh, I saw her at least three or four times, unfortunately, develop fatty atrophy of the uh, sciatic uh, nerve fascicles and never went back to normal. Piriformis syndrome is most well known as uh, sciatic neuropathy. Uh, the etiology is um, primarily due to loss of sciatic foramen uh, volume. There is something occupying the greater sciatic notch. And in many instances, it's the piriformis muscle itself that may be hypertrophic. So some people may have a bigger piriformis muscle on one side. However, a bigger piriformis muscle is not always uh, causing piriformis syndrome. So you want to see the larger muscle plus the signal changes in the nerve in order to call piriformis syndrome. Trauma, um, uh, patients who have, uh, for example, I had a patient who fell off a horse um, and had a hematoma of the piriformis muscle, and acquired entrapment of the sciatic nerve, that's uh, another cause. Inflammation, we just saw the case of sacral osteomyelitis with abscesses in that location. 
local ischemia intramuscular course. We're going to talk a little bit about that um, and uh, compression of the superior gluteal nerve can give very similar symptoms to piriformis syndrome. So this uh, neurovascular bundle here, if the entrapment is up in the supra piriformis uh, notch. Uh, piriformis syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. So these patients have sciatica. They have typically undergone a lumbosacral spine MRI that is completely normal or doesn't make, uh, doesn't, the findings don't explain the sciatica. And then the clinical presentation is sacral or gluteal pain, tenderness over the piriformis muscle, which is aggravated by sitting, squatting, or walking, and rel relieved by lying supine. And if any of you listening to me, if you have had a discrimination, you know that lying supine is not easy when you have a disc pressing on your radicular, um, on, 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 on a radicular um, structure, on a root. So that th this is the difference between in the clinical presentation, piriformis syndrome tends to be more, um, uh, the symptoms tends, tend to be aggravated by sitting and squatting rather uh, in a relief when the piriformis is relaxed uh, in the supine position. A neurological deficit is infrequent. Well, we have, um, we may have decreased ankle reflex and knee and hip flexor weakness and numbness. <clears throat> Oh, I grabbed something, the annotate function, okay. Now, oh, what do I do? Okay, all right. So now, um, this is an example of a split piriformis. Um, the sciatic nerve is going intramuscular within the piriformis. This is a PSIF sequence. You can see that it's not all the nerve going within the muscle is the peroneal division. So the peroneal division is running intramuscularly and that was causing uh, sciatica on the left. Look at the nerve a compar comparison um, side to side, lower down by the gemelli muscle. So the left side, left sided sciatic, sciatic nerve was twice as big as the right uh, sided sciatic and the patient has symptoms on that side. So this peroneal division intramuscular course can actually cause um, piriformis syndrome. Uh, this is a case of piriformis syndrome due to a space occupied lesion. Uh, this was a um, paralibral cyst that decided to go rogue and went into the greater sciatic notch. It happens sometimes and the uh, neck of the um, paralibral cyst could be seen right here. It was coming from the posterior superior um, labrum, uh, right hip labrum. Uh, and it was causing a significant mass effect. You can see the, uh, the cyst right there and trapping the sciatic nerve against the piriformis uh, muscle. Let's move on to the femoral nerve. The femoral nerve receives contributions from L2, L3, and L4. It supplies all the anterior thigh muscles except the tensor fascia lata, and it gives a sensory innervation to the anterior and distal medial thigh, anterior medial knee, medial leg, medial uh, ankle and foot, so all along the course of the saphenous nerve. Um, on a mat anatomy, the uh, nerve is really difficult to visualize in the pelvis because it runs sandwiched between the psoas and the iliacus, and those two muscles are huge. So who is going to see the little femoral nerve in between the, the, those, those two guys? But now we can see it thanks to PSIF, and I'm going to show you that. Once we get to the femoral triangle, um, the nerve is going to be seen lateral to the femoral artery and vein. We have it here, and it has a fascicular pattern too. So it's similar to a sciatic nerve, but you can see fascicles with fat interspersed between them. Uh, and these are uh, intermediate in signal intensity. This is just another presentation here of the femoral nerve, just lateral to the femoral vessels. Um, and this is what um, we do with the PSIF sequence. We can track the, this, the structure uh, painfully, 
0.8 millimeter by 0.8 millimeter um, uh, slides. And then what we do is we reconstruct uh, those points. And you can see that's the femoral nerve. Now we can visualize it in the pelvis as it goes in between the psoas and the iliacs. In the pelvis, the uh, femoral nerve is located under the psoas and over the iliacus. Uh, when it gets to the um, to the inguinal ligament, it goes under the inguinal ligament and then in the femoral triangle is lateral to the uh, femoral vessels. I thought this case uh, is nice because it illustrates it's a schwannoma that illustrate, illustrates the location of the nerve. So you can see the psoas here, the iliacus there, and the mass in between the two with the typical target sign of a um, uh, peripheral nerve sheet tumor. And these are the T1-weighted images also just uh, demonstrating the anatomy of the femoral nerve. So as muscle here, iliacus there, and then you can see uh, the schwannoma in between with enhancement on post-contrast images and uh, the uh, nice uh, tail sign uh, of um, peripheral nerve sheet tumor. This is a, a case that um, retrospectively, I found the femoral nerve and I was very happy to do it. So this patient has a tear of the iliopsoas tendon from the left septrocanter, avulsion of the uh, iliopsoas tendon. When the iliopsoas gets upset, and I have to say I got a call this morning at 6 o'clock in the morning by Eric Hume. He runs the um, hip prosthetic um, program at Presbyterian across the street uh, from my office. And he wanted me to uh, give him a, a report on MRI in a patient with a hip replacement who had iliopsoas uh, infectious bursitis due to um, inf uninfected, uh, unfortunately, hip prosthesis. So very similar to what I'm showing you here, but this was traumatic um, um, Dr. Hume's case, uh, patient was um, post-operative, uh, post post-hip um, uh, replacement. So we, the arrow is pointing to the femoral nerve outlined by fluid in between the iliacus and the psoas, and this is the, the tear of the, um, the, of the tendon with retraction and formation of a hematoma with fluid seeping along the course of the psoas and the iliacus into the pelvis. So causes of entrapment of the femoral nerve in this case would, would be hematoma of the uh, iliacus and psoas. That's a very common cause. Uh, iatrogenic, uh, traumatic gunshot wounds, lacerations, distended iliopsoas bursa, and pseudoaneurysm aneurysm of the iliac vessel. The obturator nerve, um, let's move on to that structure. It has contributions from L2, L3, and L4. It fuses with the psoas major muscle along its uh, medial margin, emerges medial to, us, to the psoas, and is going to descend uh, medial to the iliopectineal line. So right here is coming down this way, and then it's going to go into the obturator foramen. Um, and split, splits into the terminal branches right proximal to it. Um, even this, you know, thinnest person in the world has some fat in the pelvic cavity. So I'd say everybody has a uh, visualizable uh, obturator nerve. So you can see the obturator nerve in everyone. Uh, you just need to look for it. So look for that vertical structure in the paraspinal soft tissues. Um, extending for, from L2, L3, and L4. And this is just to show the anterior and posterior divisions. Um, the nerve splits into those two, just uh, proximal to the obturator foramen. This patient unfortunately had lung carcinoma with a metastatic uh, focus uh, to the right acetabulum, and that was causing entrapment of the obturator nerve. Uh, giving the classic denervation pattern of uh, obturator uh, externus and adductor muscle denervation, edema light change uh, of obturator neuropathy. Um, we also see obturator neuropathy in post-op cases. Um, very often, pelvic, major pelvic uh, procedures such as total hysterectomy for endometrial cancer 
or total prostatectomy for prostatic cancer. This is the, the uh, a patient who had undergone uh, hysterectomy, and we can see how the right-sided obturator, extern obturator sternus and adductor musculature are decreased in size, and there is fatty uh, replacement and also uh, loss of bulk. And then on fluid-sensitive sequences, you see the typical denervation pattern of muscle, where the muscle is bright and it's almost as, as if you ask a very keen child to color in the muscle without going outside of the borders, right? That, that there are kids who, who do that, who can do that, they just stay within the margins of the muscle. The innervation does that, it stays within the margins of the fascia. You don't want to have any intermuscular fluid, you don't want to have any fascial thickening, you don't want to have any fascial edema, it's just the muscle that is brighter um, uh, as compared to the adj other adjacent muscles. Looking, probing into, into this patient, we found the culprit. The culprit was scar tissue right here in the obturator foramen that was stenting uh, the branches of the obturator nerve. Uh, so sometimes we get lucky and we see the area of adhesions where uh, the nerve got injury, injured during surgery. And typically it's not transection, typically is a stretch injury because they are pulling, you know, um, down there in the lower pelvic cavity and they pull the obturator nerve a little bit too much and, and that's how it gets damaged. Uh, 61 year old, a status post postratectomy, exactly the same. I'm not going to um, dwell into this, but that's the typical pattern of distribution of iatrogenic obturator nerve injury. So key factors. Uh, the nerve may be injured, injured directly, transected during pelvic surgery, but more commonly it is a stretch during prolonged lithotomy position or retraction during THA. Uh, and this often results, it goes away. Clin the clinical presentation is weakness in hip adduction, sensory loss medial to the knee and the thigh, and typically we don't see any masses, we just see the denervation edema pattern in the adductor uh, musculature. Lateral femoral cutaneous right nerve receives contributions from L2 and L3. It goes under the psoas muscle across the iliacus, and it goes by the um, inguinal ligament at the IS. ISIS, anterior, anterior superior iliac spine, and then it pierces the uh, fascia lata and in, innervates the lateral um, dispatch of lateral uh, thigh skin. It's a purely sensory uh, nerve, so it, that there is no motor uh, dysfunction associated with lateral femoral cutaneous neuropathy. It's just pain in that distribution, and we call this meralgia parasterica. Interestingly enough, most of the cases I've, see, I've seen are in young athletes who have a non-fused anterior superior iliac spine. Um, they play lacrosse, they play football, they play soccer. So there is a lot of torque motion at the um, waist um, and they get avulsion of the anterior superior iliac spine and that causes the um, entrapment of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. I've seen also patients um, during pregnancy that, you know, uh, this was a twin, a, a, a mother of twin babies, and the, the, the pressure of the, of the weight from the abdomen into the anterior superior iliac spine caused her meralgia parasterica, which, um, yeah, you know, like carrying twins and having meralgia parasterica, the poor thing. And uh, also, some people like to wear very tight belts. If the belt is pressed over the anterior superior leg spine, that also can cause meralgia parasterica. All right, so this is one of the cases, uh, lacrosse player in Long Island, where I used to live, and I now live partially too. Um, so the anterior superior iliac spine got detached uh, from the rest of the iliac bone, and you can see how that effaces the, pl the planes about the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Just a little bit of uh, word about the pudendal nerve. Uh, 
the pudendal nerve is a little crazy. So you can see uh, here we are tracking the pudendal nerve from its takeoff in the uh, lumbosacral plexus as it goes down um, into the pelvis. So it has, it changes its mind, you know, it goes back and then it goes, it, it goes anteriorly. It's at this point um, in Alcox canal where typically we're going to see entrapment of the pudendal nerve. Uh, this is one of those nice uh, reconstructions uh, tracking the pudendal nerve. And this is a, a work that we did with Ronald Adler um, at um, NYU, uh, fusing MR and ultrasound to um, guide uh, injections of the pudendal nerve. This was published in the Journal of Ultrasound. Um, about four or five years ago, if you are interested in uh, reading the article, and it was written by Christopher Burke, who is still works at NYU. So pudendal neuropathy, um, uh, typically entrapment is at Arcos Canal. Cyclists, uh, people who do a lot of biking, may have also entrapment of the nerve against the seat. Uh, it gives perineal and genital numbness and incontinence. It's classically worse on seating. And um, we, when we, once we make the diagnosis, that there is no denervation edema pattern with this. Uh, we just want to find the nerve in Alcox canal, find the change in caliber and signal intensity there. I find the PSIF coronal sequence very useful, the one that is going through the Alcox canal. So I, I zoom my eyes in that location and compare side to side. To, to check for the uh, change in signal intensity. And of course, if you want, you can do a um, diagnostic injection uh, to help you make the diagnosis. So in conclusion, there are multiple potential etiologies for neurogenic pain, uh, localization of symptoms, as well as knowledge of the neural anatomy are of critical import importance in the search for the uh, etiology and muscle denervation changes are very useful secondary sign of neuropathy, particularly in the absence of a detectable compressive etiology on MRI. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. I hope that uh, you place your questions in the chat room and I'll be happy to uh, answer those questions uh, offline. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was such a beautiful lecture. Um, we really, really appreciate it, and uh, it was it was such great a review of anatomy. I think there are a couple questions. That, uh, Daniel, are you going to lead this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can lead this. Thank you so much, Dr. Brancantino. Amazing uh, images, uh, great cases. So we have two questions. Uh, the first one's from Dr. Aranas. He's asking, can we use Dixon for fat suppression? Yes, of course. Yes. Uh, can be used. Um, it is not included in, 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 in my protocol. I continue to do this, you know, like uh, we, we get used to the way things look uh, in our protocols and we get confident, um, you know, on, on, on the way that we assess the images. So I don't, I don't use Dixon, but of course, if, if, if anyone wants to use it, they are welcome to use it. Okay, thank you. And the second question is from Dr. Minero. He's asking uh, which is the role, like what's the role for ultrasound imaging and do you recommend to use this uh, modality? So I am shadowing Dr. Anja Greenfield, who is my director of ultrasound at Penn. And she finds the pudendal nerve and the ultrasound. I don't know if I'm going to get there one day, but um, yes, there are people who can do this and they're all. <laughs> <laughs> Believe yeah. me, I've seen it with my own eyes. I'm like, what? what is she doing there? But she <laughs> and, and the patient's response. <laughs> I feel your pain. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I had a question about the magic angle effect on nerve signal, and um, I, I just wonder if you have uh, any comments on that in in terms of um, yeah. the sciatic nerve. Yeah, the sciatic nerve, I don't see much problems except 
except when it goes through <laughs> through the inferior portion of the piriformis, it that, that it has that little bend there as it goes by the gemelli. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful. I think we need to pair the signal change with caliber change. Um, mm -hmm. And it depends on the stage of um, entrapment. So if it's very early on, the patient may only have the signal change, not the caliber change yet. So I think in those cases, it's very important to grab the phone and ask, ask the referrer if this makes sense for, you know, sciatic nerve entrapment. Don't, don't just, I, I, I wouldn't make the diagnosis without making the phone call. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, I, I just want to thank you on the on behalf of um, all of the uh, folks who are on the call here um, for Health for the World. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with uh, people around the world. Um, and uh, I do know that you, you have to get going. So I just want to thank you so much for um, your time and, uh, and all your contributions uh, to the health of people around the world. Thank you, Dr. Dillon. That's, that's what we are for. Here. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it's people like you that make it really worthwhile. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dillon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And bye-bye to everybody.